Good evening, everyone, uh, to the final session uh, for the first day of LitFest X. Uh, we are very excited to have our next guest, uh, Ms. Tablin Singh, with us on the show. Um, Tablin doesn't need an introduction, but for our global audience and for people who will be watching this feed later, Tablin is a very well-known journalist in India. Uh, and who's been tracking the political scene for a very, very long time. She began her career at the very crucial time of the emergency in India, and which has uh, led her to document, to, sorry, document several of the landmark events uh, in the country's past, uh, post the emergency. Uh, besides her last book, Darbar, she has also co-authored, she has also authored several books like Kashmir, A Tragedy of Errors, Lollipop Street, Why India Will Survive Her Politicians, and Political and Incorrect. Uh, today we are discussing with her uh, a topic titled, Is Lachyun's Delhi Still a Darbar? Uh, Tamling, um, you know, a lot of your work has been about, uh, you know, the colonial feudalism uh, which has passed off for democracy since 1947, as you, uh, you know, uh, have put this across. Tell us a little bit about uh, your current work and, uh, you know, what you covered in Darbar and post-Darbar, what you see happening. Well, I wrote Darbar when there was, you should see, to have a Darbar, you have to have a ruling family. The whole point about Darbar, when I wrote it, was that we have been ruled in India uh, in the name of democracy by really one family since 1947. And at the moment, um, this family is not in power. So there isn't a Darbar in any real sense, because uh, what used to happen and right up to the change of government last year was that there were a whole lot of people who were the gatekeepers to the Darbar, who had special access to Sonia Gandhi or Rahul Gandhi or Priyanka Gandhi. And they still do, but they don't have access to Mr. Modi. And Mr. Modi doesn't seem to have a Darbar. So there has been a change since the election. So, you know, uh, yes, in the literal sense, uh, one can agree that, you know, there is no Darbar because as you say, uh, there are no Darbaris anymore. Yeah. And uh, but in terms of uh, you know the 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 underlying change you know uh, around our socio-political climate, where yeah. do you see that going? I mean, you know, in, in many ways we've been uh, living in a uh, you know socialist environment. You know, uh, look at the number of uh, proper schools or hospitals. Mm. Or, you know, in general, uh, healthcare facilities, etc., that uh, we have. You know, I mean, even our top cities uh, don't have uh, you know adequate facilities. So, uh, mm. why do you think this has happened? Uh, you know, we we've, we've been uh, growing at a decent rate. One can argue in the last decade or so. Uh, but mm. w what's happened? Well, you see, I really believe. That the that all the change that has happened has been actually despite government, because unfortunately for us, the people who took over from the British Raj continued with a very colonial form of government, where there was a civil service that continued to owe its loyalty to the rulers, which is a colonial way of of doing things rather than to the people. Now, in countries that have deeper democracy than we do, our democracy is really something to do only with elections. But where you have deeper uh, democracy, um, the civil service or you know all officials owe their loyalty to the people, which is what, if you remember, Anna Hazare kept trying to say, that you are our servants, behave like our servants. That hasn't happened yet. But certainly what the election of Narendra Modi shows is that there's a, there are millions of young Indians. Uh, what is it? It's something like more than 50% of the population of India is under the age of 25. 
and they are very aspirational and they're not prepared to put up with bad hospitals and bad schools and cities that look like uh, slums they want they have middle class aspirations and they these are aspirations that have been built oddly enough by technology by television and the cell phone not from anything that government has done it's really despite government so you know th these are very healthy changes but because the legacy of colonial governance is so uh, solid it'll take a while before things start to change really so are you are you then saying that you know for some reason or the other the the poor and poverty have have not been you know uh, touched or they haven't been uh, you know disturbed if if you will they they've just you know, let be. Uh, no, I think that they were kept poor because uh, political parties uh, were run in a very feudal way. So, you know, nearly every political party in India is a private limited company, you know, you, with heirs who take over from daddy or mummy or whatever. And this is a very unhealthy thing, you see. So why should they, and they continue to be elected because they have the whole machinery that goes with getting elected, like, uh, you know, the, the, from the strong men to the party machinery. And that's all been taken over in a very feudal way. So it's not just the poor that have suffered. It is the rich as well. You know, I, I don't know whether you've ever seen a tax raid. But these people, this it, you know, it's a very brutal form of statism where they can come into your house if somebody wants them to. And, uh, you know, they, they don't need a warrant. They don't need anything. They can go through your papers. They can maybe even plant something on you. And uh, you, you're just as vulnerable as the poor. These are things that must change if India is to really grow into a proper democracy. So, um, yeah, if, like you mentioned, you know, we had this past which was called a democracy but wasn't a proper democracy. Um, you know, given the election mandate that India gave last year, uh, yeah. and you know we've seen you know a fair amount of time now pass after that mandate, what do you mm. see currently is you know working, not working? Uh, there are some things that have changed, uh, you, you know, in a very healthy way. I think that the prime minister's emphasis on social change has been a very good one. You know, it's shocking that India, um, that 60 percent of Indians don't have access to a toilet, no sanitation. And, you know, for him to get up and say that from the Red Fort and to try and inspire people to change their ways. Then his emphasis on on daughters, you know, on the girl child is a very good one, because, you know, when the, when there's a popular leader, who says these things, it makes a difference. His emphasis on urbanization. You know, he keeps saying we're no longer a country of villages. We are a country that is going to live in cities. These are all very good things that he's done. Uh, you know, we don't want to get into foreign policy, but he's made some very good foreign policy changes. Um, I think that the, the economy has not changed fast enough and the political culture has not changed fast enough. Um, if I had been him, you know, wishful thinking, I would have told my ministers not to live in Latian's bungalows. I would have told them to live in, you know, rent, which is what happens all over the world. In America, it's just, I think, the president who gets a house. I don't even think the vice president gets government accommodation. So, you know, they keep on about how their salaries are too low. Pay them more, but let them live like you and I do and face the the things that we, you and I do. So I think that that political culture, he has, he's hesitated to change. And I wish he hadn't. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of, uh, like you mentioned, uh, there's no darbar, there are no darbaris, but the, uh, but the culture of, uh, you know, entitlement to a certain yes. extent remains. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, to one, to uh, you know, to a certain extent, you know, one can't change that culture overnight as well. You know that yeah. uh, you know whether we like it or not, 
you know one would consider consider that to be one of the perks of uh, holding that position and but you know there are certain things that he can change for instance do you know that every ex chief minister in bihar and rajasthan and uh, uttar pradesh an ex chief minister gets a government house for life so even when they're kicked out of power they're given these fine bungalows that taxpayers pay for now why do we have that so you know those are things that really should go so for instance i was in bihar the other day and the only clean street in bihar in patna is where these ex chief ministers have their bungalows now you know that's really bad because if bihar is a very poor state uh, and you know the taxpayers of this very poor state without basic health care basic education are paying for their um, chief ministers and ex chief ministers to live like kings this is ridiculous i'm going to switch gears a little uh, you know to go a little more macro now um, you know so once we spoke about this uh, culture of uh, entitlement and like you mentioned you know you're seeing you know uh, former ministers uh, being given such benefits so hmm. in many ways do you think we have only created uh, a more colonial culture even after our colonial masters have departed uh yes we've actually uh, really um done more to colonize india since independence than even the british did so for instance we produced all our best schools teach only in english and um all our best hospitals are copied from the the west we, we don't provide for ordinary indians uh you know in their own languages Uh, halfway decent schools you know in a state like bihar for instance village schools are just empty rooms and children sit on dirt floors and that's not just bihar it's in a lot of places these are things we should be very ashamed of but we they've never come into the conversation and i'm very glad that they're beginning to come in now but you know look how colonized we are that indian bookshops uh, the we're the only country in the world where our bookshops don't sell books in indian languages but in english right right and 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 to that you know there's been a lot of uh, you know a lot of talk of parivartan and vikas by the yeah. government and yeah rightfully so uh, you know any kind of progress will have to come through a process of change and transformation but what yeah. is the extent of change or parivartan uh, required you know across the entire strata it's beyond belief beyond belief it is i mean we can't even begin to we don't even know where to start because actually we've been ruled by a small elite um of english speaking very colonized elite which co-opted then uh, certain other leaders into this little circle um but the the vast majority of indians have had no say in governance uh really I, i'm no big fan of anna hazare but until that movement nobody even noticed how angry people were with the fact that they have no say they elect somebody and then they don't see them for 5 years so wherever you go at election time they say we haven't seen the mp you know in 5 years in other countries where democracy is stronger the mp is obliged to meet people when he when they want to see him here they you know hide behind bungalows and security and their constituents never get to see them so it's there's much that needs to change not just politically economically we should really decentralize um the the, the economy so that villages have more say in governance um you know i mean at the moment you want to build a school in a village you have to go and see the collector the collector shouldn't exist there are no collectors in england they were here to collect taxes on behalf of the british government from indians and we continued with this you know so what we have is really a colonial form of governance that desperately needs to be changed so what you're saying in effect is that you know uh, there is a, a still an element of uh, 
darbar and darbaris at certain levels of the uh, you know administration of government right there's so, still democratic feudalism democratic can, yeah there that, that that still exists so where to from here then i mean you know we've got a new government in place uh, we've got uh, a government and certainly a prime minister which is talking change and you know i believe genuinely wants change for the country and progress for the country um, but where do you think uh, you know we are going from here well it's been very bad so you know we can only get better but you know what what i notice when i travel is a real impatience uh, because now there's a huge middle class a middle class created by the way only when the the um, they loosened the economy in 1991 until 1991 there was hardly a middle class in india you know i mean you, you could fit the middle class into the delhi jimkhana club in delhi and now you've got this huge middle class it's 300 million strong they say and i actually believe it's larger than that because they're not counting the rural middle class and so you know things have changed for the better um at least we're talking about parivartan and vikas we weren't even doing that before it was all you know feudalism and you know so the, there is a change and a happy one so when you when you're talking about you know the past many decades where you're talking about you know us being run as a feudal uh, society uh do you think all the problems that we had were were really genuine or or were some political problems just there to a mask or distract us from our economic woes oh i you know when i was uh, when i was in my reporting days i covered uh, two states very carefully the punjab problem i actually saw develop and i saw what happened in kashmir and in both cases uh, they were problems that shouldn't have existed if you start with kashmir for instance the historical problem ended when bangladesh happened and after bhutto was hanged uh, there were very few kashmiris left who wanted to go to pakistan and then you know there was this deal with sheikh abdullah and there was that first election in 1983 after he died and farooq abdullah won fair and square but mrs gandhi did not allow him to continue to rule so his government was toppled in 84 and the kashmiris felt that they were again being discriminated against they weren't being, they were being denied fundamental democracy then again it could have been sorted out in 86 but instead of just ordering an election rajiv gandhi insisted on the national conference coming with him in an alliance so the opposition space was left to the islamist fundamentalists and now you have another kashmir problem in punjab you know with sant bhindran wale i mean i i tell you i could have handled it you know it was the easiest thing in the world to do but they allowed these things to continue just as they allow casteism to continue and poverty to continue because it distracts from the failures of our rulers who we should actually not call our rulers but that's the that's what they are so you know in the uh, in this entire backdrop of in you know, the last many decades where we where we've really in many ways been left to a laissez faire sort of system of uh, governance and yeah. now now when we are seeing a very proactive pmo who is out there yeah. you know uh, speaking directly to the public you know through various forms of communication asking for uh, you know uh, responses to various things do you do you see a big opportunity from for change especially from a communication perspective like you said in terms of you know people getting a chance to say well what do we want so fine we've given a mandate but after giving the mandate what do we want and you know how can we get it yes i do see it but it's not happening fast enough 
you know, the, the prime minister is very active on social media, but there is a, a huge India out there that is not on social media. So oh. I must tell you, I went in just now in Bihar to the school where those children died, remember, from eating a midday meal. Right. And I was astounded that in this fairly remote village, they were telling me about how I could find such and such a thing on Facebook and, you know, how if I looked up this on the Internet. So it's spreading. But I'm actually I have more faith in in technology forcing our politicians to change rather than it being the other way around. I think if they could turn off the Internet and take away our cell phones, they would do it in a minute. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, talk when you mentioned about schools, I will, you know, on that point, there's been a lot of talk about the demographic dividend, so to yeah. say that India will reap in time to come. Mm. And But mm. clearly, uh, you know, there are signs somewhat to the contrary. And uh, yeah. what are your views on that? I feel very strongly about education. I really believe that uh, that in this first year of uh, Modi being prime minister, his failure, I know that education, primary education is a state subject, and that, uh, but I really believe that a policy, uh, a model for a new policy coming from Delhi would be followed, would be appreciated. And what we really need to do is to give the control of schools to citizens. So, for instance, the village should not be dependent on the state government to run the school well. Because, you know, if you let, if you decentralize, because there is a license Raj in education that must go, it should be given to the people to, because, you know, uh, the, the, there's a market um, uh, way in which if a school or a college is not good enough, uh, people will not go there. And villagers often say to me on my travels, they say, just give us recognition for our school and we'll run it ourselves. But instead of that, we have this huge, cumbersome socialist idea that from Lucknow, you're going to run every school in UP and from Patna, you're going to run every school in Bihar. That doesn't work. And the minute you start having proper schools, the minute you actually decentralize through a policy decision that must come, a direction has to come from Delhi. And I'm very disappointed that that hasn't happened yet. So you're seeking a lot more decentralization on the primary total, total and higher education. We don't need the, you know that the NCERT controls all technical education in India. So if you try to teach a child science in your bedroom, technically you can be arrested for violating the NCERT rules. Similarly, what, what do you need this university grants commission? Why can't colleges and universities run themselves? And why don't they allow more to come up? Do you know how complicated it is to set up a school or a college in India? It's almost impossible. You need something like 60 permissions before you can do that. So, you know, that we've got a long way to go. And it's the most important thing we can do because everything else, health care, hygiene, um, civic sense, um, a duty to your country, everything comes from schools. On, on that note, Tavleen, we are also now taking in questions from the online viewers right now. Yeah. And uh, whilst we have quite a few questions, I'm just picking off one. Um, it is uh, from Rupali and she says, what have you turned to embrace the most in you, journalist or author? And is it one influencing the other? Uh, well, you know, I had to work as a journalist to earn a living. Uh, becoming an author was just to help my journalistic career. <laughs> well put, well put. Speaking of, uh, you know, uh, authoring uh, your next book, uh, Tablin, uh, I know you're uh, very close to finishing your next book after that. Bar. Oh, it's finished. Oh, it's finished. It's with the publisher. Okay. Tell us a little about it. It's a book uh, that actually covers the sort of subjects we've been talking about. It's called India's Broken Tryst. 
okay. uh, from the tryst with destiny uh, speech that uh, our first prime minister made. And uh, basically, it's about how, uh, you know, why democracy has actually failed most Indian citizens, whether it's the police that they deal with, whether it's officials. We still have officials and the state behaving as though they were the master. And so this is a book really about how citizens in this country have been failed because of this. Right. And, and when is it going to be out, the book? Well, I hope soon. I'm trying. I've been sent it to the publisher, and you know, once you send a book to the publisher, you want him to bring it out the next week. But I imagine that early next year, early next year. Lovely, lovely. We've got another question uh, from one of the online viewers, who is very keen to know the following. He says, "Please tell us more about your encounters with the city." and episodes that changed your opinion forever. With who? With who? So it, I think it just broadly says with the city. Hmm. I'm assuming... With the city. Oh, yes, yeah, so it really I'm assuming uh, you know, with your time with uh, sort of uh, the high-flying, uh, you know... Uh, okay, Latians, uh, yes. Latians high-flying drawing rooms. Huh? Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, you know, I actually, I'm a child of Latians, Delhi, because my grandfather was one of those five contractors who built Latians, Delhi. And so I grew up in Jantar Mantar Road, like a lot of other children of, of I was a grandchild of the city. And um, in those days, it wasn't so much a power center as, uh, you know, as just a place where people lived and lived quite nicely with nice houses and gardens. And then around, I think, the time of emergency is when we began to see that it become the center of power in India, you know. And then it became uglier and uglier because then the, after Mrs. Gandhi was killed, walls started going up around those bungalows. And, you know, we, we then found now what you've got is Latians Delhi has a standard of living that is 10 times higher than the standard of living of millionaires in Bombay. And I don't think that's a very good thing. You know, they've taken over the most expensive real estate in India. It's the price of land in Latins Delhi is 150 crores an acre. And you have ministers and MPs who live on in houses that sit on five acres. So now it's, in my view, a very ugly place, Latins Delhi. <laughs> and, you know, in closing, um, I will ask you about, uh, you know, post writing the bar and yeah. uh, post the elections. So mm. you've seen, you know, major change in uh, India in the political scenario, right? Yeah. Mm. You actually saw, uh, you know, like you mentioned, the Darbaris go away. You've actually seen. Yeah. Uh, 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 an entirely new regime which is saying things which are different, hopefully uh, delivering on it as well. Hmm. Do you see, I mean, uh, yourself filled with more optimism than uh, yeah. despair or and, and optimism? Why? Oh, I see. I, I'm much more optimistic about India than I've ever been. Um, we've been through a very dark phase in our history. Uh, it hasn't seemed that way except to political journalists and, e and not even to political journalists because most political journalists have supported this very elite leftist feudal structure. But now I see the walls around Latins Delhi, for instance, crumbling. I see people understanding their rights more than they ever have. And this is very healthy. There's a deepening of democracy and we really need that. Great, great. So, thank you so much, Tavleen, for You're very welcome to be on uh, this virtual session. Um, you know, I'm I'm pretty thank you. that uh, post the session as well. Uh, uh, viewers and your readers and fans will uh, have some good time viewing this session uh, once it's up on YouTube. And um, tell them to buy the book. Tell them to buy my new book. Absolutely. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, 
we'll be happy to uh, you know announce also when your new book arrives and we'll be happy to do a session with you on your new book uh, when it's once it's available so i'll be very happy to do that kumar thank you thank you so much take care bye bye thank you you too bye